do you think there's anything to this idea that maybe ADHD and autism are all part of the same thing? So on one hand, I think there might be some accuracy to that. On the other hand, you know, I've, I've read some of the research articles that have suggested ADHD and autism are part of the same spectrum. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A OK a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 239 of ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I hope that you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyoutsuka.com. My purpose, you know it, it's always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. And in the thousands of ADHD women that I have had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one, not one that wasn't truly brilliant at something. So, of course, I am just delighted to introduce you to our guest. I found her through one of our wonderful listeners who wrote me this. I heard your request for an autism slash ADHD expert who has autism slash ADHD on your podcast today. Have you tried to reach Dr. Neff? And then she gives us the... Um, the Instagram handle, which is neurodivergent underscore insights. She would fit the bill amazingly, exclamation point. Hope you're able to get her on your show. Thanks so much for all you do, Stephanie B. So thank you, Stephanie, for writing. Because of you, I get to introduce our next guest, Dr. Megan Anna Neff. Did I get that right, Megan? Anna? Yes, you did. Megan I know, Anna. A lot. Now I want to say Anna, even though I asked you, which way is it? So Dr. Megan Anna Neff is a clinical psychologist based in Oregon who specializes in working with neurodivergent adults and providing neurodivergent affirming assessments. As a late-in-life diagnostic autistic adhd -er, she is dedicated to educating the mental health field on non-stereotypical presentations of autism and ADHD. Dr. Neff, who is in a cross-neurotype marriage and is a parent to two neurodivergent children, brings personal and professional insights to her work. Dr. Neff has authored two books, and she's the author of a forthcoming book, Self-Care for Autistic People. Additionally, she has published in several peer-reviewed journals. So, Megan, did I get... Megan, Anna, did I get all of that right? <laughs> you, yes, you did. You nailed it. Wonderful. So, you know, I have been looking high and low literally for years for you. Someone no I have, and I have talked about it on the podcast ad nauseum. And, you know, some references would trickle in, but I just never felt it was the right person until you, because not only do you have autism and ADHD, but you are also an expert and this is your work around, you know, in autism and ADHD. So I can't even begin to tell you how delighted I am to have you here. Well, thank you so much. All of a sudden, the pressure's building. Like, oh no, you've been searching for me for years, and <laughs> for my I'm life, an expert. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and it's really hard to find. And what I found so interesting is, every once in a while, I would actually find someone. 
who had both and was an expert in both. But for whatever reason, they didn't want to come on the podcast. That was just something that made them so uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And what's funny is normally ADHD people are like, yeah, I'll come on. I can talk about anything. So I'm, I was wondering if maybe it was the autism piece that, I don't know, gave them more pause. That, you know, that would make sense to me. I do actually have a podcast as well. And I talk about this on my podcast of I I've recently like stepped down from accepting public speaking gigs. And it's interesting. I actually have some ADHD colleagues where I do public speaking with them. And whenever we partner, like she's like, yes, let's go, let's do it. And I have so much demand avoidance and resistance. It, it does take a different kind of toll, I think, on on many autistic people to for public speaking partly we're so prone to ruminating over everything we say afterwards. So Mm -hmm. the idea of having it out there forever where anyone can listen to is kind of terrifying. That's so interesting, but it makes perfect sense. So before we talk about autism and ADHD, you know, or hopefully you know that I always want to talk about ADHD first in terms of the circumstances around your diagnosis so that our listeners can get kind of a frame of reference who we're talking to. Absolutely. So I, in some ways, I feel like I have the really classic neurodivergent, kind of the lost generation of neurodivergent women story. And in other ways, I think I have a pretty different story. So I'll I'll unpack both of those briefly. The way it's the classic story is that it was through my children's diagnoses that I discovered my neurodivergence at the age of 37. And I see that all the time in people that come to me, in people I'm in contact with, that it's often through our children's stories that we begin to truly understand ourselves. The part that's a little bit less conventional for my story is that I found the autism first and then discovered the ADHD. What I often see is people discover the ADHD first or they're diagnosed with that first. And then sometimes the autism is never diagnosed or identified, or eventually it's diagnosed later I think what often happens is because there is so much overlap, if someone, for example, has been diagnosed with ADHD, but they're having autistic traits, they might assume it's part of the ADHD. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing the same thing, but with autism, all of my ADHD traits, like my difficulty with rest, my, my exact, I mean, executive functioning can be a part of autism, but Mm -hmm. the extent of my executive functioning struggles are very ADHD connected, but I was associating that to autism. So it took me a while to realize, oh, this isn't just autism. This is autistic ADHD. And so in that way, my story is a bit unconventional and that the autism came first. Okay. So I'm curious, what was Megan Anna like as a child? She was interesting. (laughs) Um, First, I love that question. But yeah, I, and I, again, this feels like a really classic neurodivergent experience, kind of the Jekyll and Hyde experience of at school and in public, very, very shy, very compliant. Um, I didn't like school and I didn't really have words for it, but I imagine it was, I think I had some undiagnosed learning differences and disability. Mm -hmm. Looking back, I can now see it was surface level dyslexia. And then, you know, with both autism and ADHD, it just made learning environments really difficult for me. But I didn't cause, you know, disruptions in the classroom. So I I kept moving along without being identified or noticed. But at home, I was I was kind of impulsive. I was very impulsive, I would say actually. I was really silly. Most people publicly see a pretty serious side of me, but in my private life, I'm actually quite silly. So as a child, I was silly. I, I'm the youngest of three. So like a lot of ADHD children, I needed stimulus if I was bored. So I would kind of poke at my sisters to get a response. So I was the youngest child who would annoy my sisters. So I was very different in the home than I was at school. So those are my young years. I also had a lot of the classic mental health struggles that a lot of ADHD girls specifically do. I had OCD as a child and then... In moving into adolescence, which is a, that's when a lot of mental health struggles start showing up for ADHD and autistic girls. Um, the social scene gets a lot more complicated. So that's when depression and anxiety and self harm and suicidality came online for me. And yeah, 
I'll pause there. Um, that was a bit of information, but my, my mental health journey partly made a lot more sense once I understood ADHD and autism, um, at the age of 37 and looking back, I was like, Oh, that's what was going on. That was, that was, oh my gosh. So you said that, um, school was difficult. However, were you a good student? Cause I hear that a lot. Like school was so hard, but I was an A student. I, I wasn't an A student. And it was interesting. My sister's like they were in the advanced classes. I was in a pretty rigorous school system. I was probably a B student. And it's interesting. I think this is also, this is kind of different than a lot of classic, like just ADHD stories I hear. I often hear when they go to college is when kind of uh, rails go off. I always try to use metaphors and then I mix them up. <laughs> <laughs> Something goes off the rails. Yeah. Um, we go me, off the rails. <laughs> So, because college is really hard for a lot of ADHDers because you lose structure. Um, for me, it was kind of the opposite. You know, my mom often said, you blossomed once you got to college. Once I was able to study the things I was interested in and then figure out a way that worked for my brain, and I did a lot of like manipulation to get information to stick in my brain, but I was interested in that process and I had time to do that once I got to college. So it was in college that I became a good student. At that point, I became an A student and then went on to um, actually be able to go to Ivy League master level program. But before that, I was a BA student and I saw myself as a struggling student. So can I ask you, the anxiety, the depression, the suicidality, all of this is happening as a teenager? Did I get that yeah, right? So like kind of 13 to to 17 were like the really intense years around that. And so puberty was kind of when it all started uh -huh. to blossom. That's insightful that of you. Yes, puberty is hard for us. Oh. And I think the the opposite, perimenopause and menopause is also hard for us. Yeah, horm anything hormonal Hormones, is going right? to be is going to be hard for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um I actually was just reading something about this and this was new for, even for me around how for some, for ADHD people who, who go through puberty, so people assigned female at birth and who are going through puberty, because of the hormonal shift, some of those, the ADHD traits or ADHD symptoms will actually become more apparent around that time, which Absolutely. again, if we look at gender bias, the DSM, it's symptoms have to show up before 12. For a lot of these girls, they're going to, you know, they're going to have compensation strategies and then it's going to be puberty where it's like, we go off the rails or whatever that metaphor is. Yeah. Well, and I think too that, what was I just thinking? Um, hold on one second. What was I just thinking about um, puberty and it going off the rails? And now I can't remember it, but it'll come later. You know, whatever. I do know. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you do know. And it's going to bug me. And so then I won't be able to think of the next thing that I wanted I know, to ask I you. I know. Those flyaway thoughts, they're so... Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I first learned about ADHD, um, there was a child who, his analogy I thought was so brilliant. I think it was a he. And he said he felt like there were butterflies all around his head and he was constantly there with a net trying to trap them. And, you know, and those were his thoughts. And I mm -hmm. often feel that. But I cannot remember what I wanted to say. So I guess it wasn't that important. In any case, the anxiety, the depression that led to suicidality, do you think that was because of your ADHD or was it also with the, do you know what I mean? That it was, yeah, what, I, I do. like, for? I don't think like it wasn't. So I often talk about misdiagnosis and missed diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a misdiagnosis and that I definitely was depressed. Okay. Um, although the context of my depression was missed, no. right? The context of my depression was coming out of ADHD and autism and the social scene being oh. confusing me, not connecting with my peers in a way that felt meaningful um, out of my all or nothing thinking. That's really classic, both for aut yeah. autism and ADHD that it predisposes a person to depression. Like if you're prone to all or nothing thinking, every time you make a mistake, you're a terrible person, right? right. And so that that's a recipe for depression and depressed mind to take over. I think a ton of, I was doing a ton of masking. So I was also exhausted. I think there was some burnout happening. Um, there was a sense of false self. And so I think the context of my depression was the undiagnosed ADHD and autism. Had I been identified and supported, 
I mean, I, I imagine I still would have had some depression. We're, we're predisposed to it, but it probably, I could have moved through it with more understanding and agency and gentleness, I believe. I wonder too, if a um, environment also, you know, played a big role because you talk about, you know, how difficult just the social, the social aspects mm-hmm. were yeah. and thinking yeah. that there's something wrong, you're different. Why can't I be like these, you know, friends or whatever? Yeah. Precisely. And I think one thing I talk about a lot is when we don't have um, kind of the luxury of an accurate narrative like ADHD or autism to understand our story, especially women, we tend to go to the character based narratives like I am bad, I am incompetent, I am too much. When we're left with those character based narratives, again, that's going to lead to a lot of depression and anxiety and, and just low self esteem. Makes perfect sense. So you go to college and all of a sudden you start to flourish. Mm -hmm. Was there any adjustment period or were you pretty surprised at how competent and capable you were? Um, it, It really wasn't too much of an adjustment. My very first year I went out to California and I often say that was like the happiest year of my life because I was, I think, cause I was in the sun a lot. I noticed for me, um, when I'm in the sun, like I just respond so well to that. I, like, um, in, in regards to kind of a reduction of some of my ADHD traits and, and just have more energy and creativity and my mood. Um, so that was a really wonderful year. I ended up transferring back to the Midwest because I, I wanted a slightly more academic university. And I think my studies were just so aligned with my values and my interests that that it really was a time of, of flourishing and expansion for me. Oh, and I, and then- I do well in academic settings. I tend to be very cerebral. And yeah. for me as an autistic person, that worked really well. I didn't have to do as much small talk or the I often talk about how I, f- I feel like I don't have social ligaments that like to get in between the conversations, but I'm good once we're in the muscle. Mm-hmm. Um, in academia, you can do that. You're talking about ideas and books and concepts, and I can dive right into those kinds of conversations. So I think that's probably why I spent, you know, 10 years after undergrad and I, I went on to 10 years of graduate school. It's academia just worked for me as an autistic person. What happened when you got out into the workforce? Um, Was that more difficult? There were pieces of it. And and it's interesting. My workforce experience has often always been connected to my training. Um, Mm Because, again, I did 10 years. I did undergrad. I did a master's. I was a stay-at-home parent for a while. And then I went back to grad school. And then I was doing – so I was doing, like, internship, practicum, residency type work. And most of that was therapy. I definitely had, looking back, some social misunderstandings, especially around hierarchy and power. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Um, (laughs) yep. And I'm like, okay, now I get it. So there were some workplace tensions, but I haven't spent a lot of time actually in traditional workplaces. What about with kids? With kids, like how I am with kids? Was that difficult or did you yes. find that pretty natural? Yes. Yeah, it was. How many kids do you have? I have two. Um, and I thought I'd love being a stay-at-home mom. My my mom, who's actually a professor, always talked about how much she loved being a stay-at-home mom before going back for her doctorate. Mm-hmm. I felt so restless the whole time. Again, I'm, I'm not good at not doing things. I was confused as to why I struggled to play with my kids in the same way I saw other moms playing with their kids. Talk more about that. I find that really interesting. And I, th- I think I see both the autism and the ADHD there. So from the autism, like things like having dolls talk to each other. Oh my goodness. I can't do that. Like, and it like hurts, it hurts my body to even try and think about doing that. Um, <laughs> from an ADHD lens, the impatience, the like need to be moving. So even, even now, like I'm embarrassed to admit this, but if I'm playing a board game with my family and if one of my kids is getting distracted and forgets it's their turn. I'll be like, it's your turn. <laughs> Cause like yeah. the impatience of just like waiting, there's a lot of waiting that goes into games and play. Or you can do what I do, which is just cheat <laughs> <laughs> because it makes it less boring. Oh, that's maybe that's why my kids sometimes cheat. <laughs> <laughs> They're making it less boring. Yeah. 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 So 
What has changed since you were diagnosed? Oh my goodness, so much. I mean, I did change my career. I started a private practice. I, I work pretty much always with neurodivergent people. So my life has changed. I've been able to restructure my life to work for my sensory profile, to work for my needs, to work with my ADHD brain. Um, but just the way I am with myself is so incredibly different. I probably, if we were doing this podcast a few years ago, well, we wouldn't because I wouldn't know I was autistic and ADHD, but if we were, I would have pre-rehearsed everything I would have said. And I wouldn't know what you're going to ask. So I would have like anticipated what you would have asked. I would have spent hours and hours pre-rehearsing what I was going to say. It would have been a very kind of scripted version of me. Mm -hmm. And so just the way I am in the world, I'm, I'm much less unmasked, which means I'm also a lot more gentle with myself. I used to have such a harsh inner critic, which I now call like the mask, the autistic or the ADHD mask was fueling that inner critic. Does your inner um, critic have a name now? It it hasn't. Do you is explicit content? Well, now it oh, now it has. It. It. Um, I it had an old name which I've I've retired to the mask. The old name was was much more vulgar. <laughs> so I just I I kind of externalize my mask of like oh that's my mask talking right now. Yeah. Which actually helps me, like if I'm starting to ruminate over a conversation or when we get done recording, I'm sure I'll ruminate over some of my answers and I'll, I'll remind myself that's the mask talking. The mask doesn't want you to like make mistakes or to fumble over your words, um, but it's okay. You're human. And I think there's, I, I see a lot of the advocacy I do as showing up as human. So like on my podcast, I fumble through words. I misuse words. And I actually adore it when I listen to it back because I, I see how I'm showing up visibly as an autistic ADHD or in all of my imperfections. And I, I hated my imperfections before my diagnosis, but now I understand them and I embrace them actually with pride, which I yeah. never thought I'd be able to say that. Oh, I love it. I love it. So um, Megan, Anna, what is the name of your podcast? Divergent Conversations, um, and we're both mental health professionals, and we're both autistic ADHDers, and we diverge all over the place. So we have kind of an anchoring idea, but then we'll often diverge in multiple ways. So it's appropriately named. I wasn't aware of it. I don't think you put it in your bio information. It might not have been public when we first connected it. We just released okay. it a couple months ago. Okay. So, um, okay. Yeah, that might be. Well, I'm going to have to listen. So it's called Divergent Conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. So in your bio, you write that you're in a cross neurotype marriage. What does that mean? So I talk a lot about cross neurotype interactions and both for ADHD and autism, but I think especially for autism, this is helpful because so long culture in the medical field has really placed the burden on the autistic person of saying, that person has communication deficits, that mm. person has social deficits. And there's actually some really interesting research that shows it's more about the cross neurotype interaction. So when you pair autistic people to autistic people, they actually build good rapport, they connect easily. So it's a cross, I think of it as a cross cultural interaction, anytime you're interacting cross neurotype. So that's why I, I phrase it as a cross neurotype marriage. My Husband is neurotypical. Um, here mm. I am as autistic ADHD. -er. He has impeccable executive functioning, which I borrow from him all of the time. And so I, I like talking about it that way because I think whenever we're in cross neurotype relationships, there's going to be different things to work out and think through and communicate through. And I think communication becomes really important when you're in a cross neurotype relationship or when you're parenting cross neurotype. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, right? <laughs> um, and I love the way that you see it. It's not that you're defective or those with ADHD and autism or those with autism or those with ADHD are defective. It's just different, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we can understand, I heard something recently and I thought it was so brilliant, you know, that empathy is not being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. It is even if you can't put yourself in someone else's shoes, you have this understanding and belief that their experience is their experience. They're not lying mm. about it. They're not making it up. They're having it. And you're okay with that. You're not telling them, no, 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 that's not what's going on, which hmm. I, I really liked. I like that too. 
So I am curious, women who have ADHD and ASD, autism, right? How do they look different than women who only have ADHD in your experience? Mm -hmm. And it can, it can show up. It's a hard question to answer because it can show up so many different ways. I often talk about like being autistic dominant versus ADHD dominant. Um, Some people won't necessarily present that way. Some people are true like swirl, but I think it depends partly on if they're autistic dominant or ADHD dominant for one. The, the differences, so um, the special interests are going to have more intensity to them. And this is a way that I actually think my autism really helps my ADHD is I still do a lot of the like passion rabbit trails, but they tend to anchor and orbit around a special interest. So they, there's a lot of association connecting them, which I actually think really helps kind of rein in my ADHD. Yeah, You know, both ADHDers and autistic people tend to have social struggles, but for different reasons. For ADHD, it's kind of, especially if it's um, combined type or hyperactive, it's that impulsivity interrupting people. I used to do a ton of that. Um, And it's, you might miss social signals because of inattention. Um, Whereas with with autism, the social struggles are going to be a little bit different in the sense of like intuitively picking up context Mm. cues, um, intuitively picking up what people mean. Like I'm a very visual, I, people often say literal, but I prefer to say visual and concrete and like the way I interpret language. So things tend to go over my head or there's a gullibility there. And I, I am doing a lot of work through my prefrontal cortex to analyze social situations. And a lot of autistic women have become pretty advanced at like decoding, but they're using the prefrontal cortex, the analytical part of the brain to do so. And so it's very, very exhausting. Sensory sensitivities tend to be more intense in autistic ADHDers than just ADHDers. And then routine. And this is where like ADHD and autism, it's, it's kind of funny to occupy both. Funny is not the right word. It can also be helpful, but that's I, I want excitement, new things, and I want routine and stability, right? And to have both of these drives be pretty strong within the same person, um, that that would be another distinction. There's a few others, but I'll stop for I'll stop for now. Thank you. Um, not for stopping, but for sharing those with us. So, <laughs> I had a guest on. I just love her. Um, her name is um, Andy or Andinette. And she was part of episode 233. And she is, so how do you, first of all, how do you say it? You say ADHD. Is that how you say it? If it's autism and ADHD, do you know how? I think I, so I'm really bad at pronouncing words. Um, I think Mm -hmm. that's right. I know it's spelled like capital A, lowercase u, and then uppercase D, H, D. Um, Yeah. I often just say autistic ADHD, but I think the way you pronounced it is right as well. I just can never fully pronounce that. (laughs) Okay. And I, and I've never heard it. So I thought, well, maybe they just write that, but then they say, you know, autism and ADHD or an ASD, you can say ASD for um, autism as well, or is that no longer? um, So this gets into a, like a, a more complex dialogue, but I actually don't use the language of ASD. Um, and it's interesting. This is, disorder is baked into ADHD. So this is a different conversation, ADHD. Autism Um, spectrum disorder. I totally get what you're saying. Because it's, um, I'm, I work from the neurodivergent affirming framework where we're depathologizing it. This is a, this is a form of human diversity. So I'll talk about being autistic, which is also like, that's different. That's identity first language, right? Whereas we're trained in the medical field. Never do that. Always say with disabilities, always say with autism. But I, I'm not ashamed of my autism. It's in the same way that it's like I've got brown hair. I like it's it's part of who I am. So I embrace it as an identity. So I'll use autistic in clinical places. I'll sometimes use the word condition instead of disorder. But I even that I don't really do. I, I just talk about being autistic. I totally get it. And I'm exactly like you. I never use disorder for ADHD. And I hadn't even connected ASD, autism spectrum disorder. So now I completely get it. So you Mm -hmm. use the term autism and I will too now. I will now too. I will, you know what, I'm going to use it. So thank you for making me aware of like connecting. Absolutely. So anyway, Andy says she has this ADHD side of herself, which is just completely spontaneous. And she'll wake up in the morning and she'll decide that, you know, I have this interest. And so I'm just going to go all out on this particular interest. So she purchases all the materials. She's got everything, you know, sitting around her home. It's a mess. 
But she's also, she's got that other side where she said, I need a tidy space, right? I'm really good at creating mess, but I can't stand mess. So it's the, the constant fighting, which I can see though, and I have a little bit of this, I can see how that would be really helpful. Like I can't stand, mm-hmm. I, I call it visual pollution. If, if there's a mess around me, my brain doesn't function. So mm-hmm. it's actually really helpful, right? Because it never gets totally out of whack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I actually think there's a lot of ways, and again, it's going to depend on the person, but I think there's a ways that like having both can actually help like help the other one out. I think there's ways that also exasperate some of the struggles, like especially when interacting with neurotypicals, like the, so, I think the social struggles are compounded, at least in my experience. Yeah. Um, but I think for, like, for me, I'm really thankful, like the ADHD kind of, it, it creates more flexibility in me. It gets me out of my ruts. It, it kind of opens me up to new experiences. Yeah. And I, I love like the infusion of creativity and spark that Mm -hmm. comes from my ADHD. And then I love the stability and the persistence and frankly, the hyper fixation that comes with the autism interest and kind of hyper fixation is my number one autistic trait. And when I'm in that mode, my distractibility becomes much less apparent. And so that's one way it it really kind of masks my ADHD actually, because I spend most of my day hyper fixated on a Mm -hmm. topic of interest. Yeah. And when we're in a topic of interest, I don't care who you are, you're just going to be so much better at what you're doing. Right. So you get really good, really fast. Mm -hmm. I always joke about, you know, well, with autism, because I mean, this topic obviously has come up over and over again. With autism, there's, there may be a difficulty in understanding the social cues versus I know with my hyperactive ADHD, I'm like, Social cues are probably one of my areas of brilliance, but the difference is that I don't care. So if I want, (laughs) I know what I'm saying is not going to go over well, but I can't stop myself because I just don't care, you know? Yeah, so absolutely. That, that impulsivity for sure. Absolutely. And I, I relate to that. And then I think to add another layer of that, like we're talking about allistic social cues. So again, if we're looking at this from a cultural perspective, like within ADHD spaces, there's like, I feel so much more free within ADHD spaces or artistic spaces. Cause I think we have different social cues, different social norms. So like autistic communication tends to be really direct. So I pick up autistic social cues pretty well. It's just, um, allistic social cues that, that I miss, and, and, but you're right. Different for different reasons. So I have been toying with the idea that maybe I may be a little bit on the autism spectrum as well. Although, could I be if, I mean, I can completely relate to that, you know, the the messiness versus the non-messiness. I have a father, sister, nephew, son who I think might be on that spectrum as well. I'm really intense in the things I care about, ridiculously intense, but I do feel like I really understand social cues. And so Mm -hmm. that is, is that really the big one that in order to, um, again, it's all on a spectrum though, right? So could it be that you have some and it, this, okay. So this is one that gets, um, tricky. I'm going to try and break it down a little bit. So technically, technically within the general population, right? Like Mm -hmm. everyone's going to have, some autistic traits, like the AQ, which is a standard screener, like very few people are going to score zero on it. So everyone's mm-hmm. going to have autistic traits. And the same dialogue's happening in ADHD in the same way. It's like, you know, I'm a little bit ADHD or I'm a little bit autistic. Yeah. There's a lot of pushback against that kind of yeah. language of I'm a little bit on the spectrum. So we're, we tend to be moving away from spectrum language. Um, I don't know if you've seen like the wheel of traits. Yeah. So like there's the wheel of traits, which is a little bit more of a dynamic look at it. So for example, I'll talk about, you know, my hyperfixation and special interest is a really elevated trait. And then some of the other traits are less elevated. And so Mm -hmm. I I think that's a helpful conceptualization. And the other fact to consider, like ADHDers do tend to have more autistic traits than than non-ADHDers. So that can be true. And at the same time, it can also be true that um, avoiding language of like a little bit on the spectrum or kind of on the spectrum, I think is a more affirmative approach to take. 
So back to your question though, social cues. Yeah. I mean, that's considered criteria of a, of autism and that Uh has to be there for, for a diagnosis. Okay. However, I will spend time in my clinical interviews. How are you reading social cues? Now, is it intuitive or is it like analytical? Okay. That person just looked away. They're crossing their arms. I know that means X, therefore this, if it's an analytical process of, of, um, decoding social cues, that's a different process than what allistic people are experiencing. So there can be autistic people who are incredibly skilled because, because they're, they're high maskers. Um, Mm -hmm. there's actually, I don't know if you've taken it. The cat cue will, is a, um, standardized assessment that actually measures how much you are masking. So if you're curious, if you might also be autistic, I would go recommend taking the cat cue in addition to the AQ. Spell that. Um, C-A-T dash Q. Um, Embrace Autism is a fantastic resource. They have a ton of free online screeners. Um, they have it up on their website. I can, I can share a link with you. Wonderful. What was I just going to, I was going to say something related to, um, oh, okay. So I'm going to go there because you just told me not to. So what I am curious about though is and this was another thing that I was talking about with Andy, um, which I thought was an interesting analogy. And, I, and I've read a little bit about this as well. And her comment was, you know, the more I study this, the more I, you know, look at myself and look at people around me that have um, similar traits. She didn't see ADHD and ASD as separate conditions. And she, what she was saying is that she almost saw it like a bunch of symptoms out there and they're all like stars, right? And we draw our own constellation in the stars and whatever that constellation is and wherever it's closest to tends to be the label that we end up with. And so do you think there's anything to this idea that maybe ADHD and autism are all part of the same thing? Our brains want it all. We love anything that is new, bright, sparkly, different. But that's often what keeps us distracted and feeling all over the place. So I have something that I know can help you. It's my free masterclass called What Do I Do With My Life From Chaos to Confidence? This popular class will give you the tools to make faster, more confident decisions that actually serve you so you're doing what you really want to do instead of what others are telling you that you should do. You know, we try so hard to fit in when in reality, that's the problem. With our ADHD brains, our brilliant ADHD brains, we're not meant to fit in. We're actually meant to stand out. So that begs the question, where are we actually meant to stand out? Join me at spyhappy.me forward slash MC. That's spyhappy.me forward slash MC. And let's find out together. Now, let's get back to our podcast. Do you think there's anything to this idea that maybe ADHD and autism are all part of the same thing? So it depends if I'm speaking from my clinical hat or my more creative hat. Um, I have sometimes, okay, this is not the clinician talking. This is not the psychologist talking. I have sometimes, especially, so the thing I'm kind of known for are my Venn diagrams where I compare two conditions um, or forms of neurodivergence. And in all of my deep dives, I was like, oh my goodness, there's so much genetic overlap. There's so much symptom overlap that I've sometimes called it like the grab bag of neurodivergent traits or like potpourri. Like once you're neurodivergent, you're just more likely to have all kinds of different sort of neurodivergent traits. You might not meet diagnostic criteria, but like you're more likely to have an obsessive brain style. You're more like, there's just all of these grab Mm -hmm. bag things. So on one hand, I I think there might be some accuracy to that. On the other hand, you know, I've, I've read some of the research articles that have suggested ADHD and autism are part of the same spectrum. I don't end up landing there. Mm-hmm. For one, part of that argument, at least in the research that I've seen, is that ADHD is like a less severe form of autism, which A, like there's so much pathology in that, but B, I just conceptually, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, I work with plenty of ADHDers who are not autistic, who like, I don't think they would describe their experience, like, first of all, just comparing severity, I think is a bad idea in general, but that just doesn't track from what I'm seeing clinically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
there, what well, we know genetically, we know that there are a lot of shared genes between ADHD and autism, but there's also some distinct genes ah. to ADHD and autism. So it commonly co-occurs in families. It commonly co-occurs in individuals. If you're autistic, you're more likely to have ADHD traits. You, again, you might not reach threshold for what clinicians would say is ADHD. Right. And if you're ADHD, you're more likely to have autistic traits. Again, might not reach that th- magical threshold that someone's decided now you're autistic, but that threshold. So yes and no, I, it would be my response. You know, and I'm thinking of my son who has probably less severe ADHD, less severe dyslexia, um, less severe visual processing disorder. He, based on a test we just took, I'm pretty confident he is also on um, the autism. You told me not to use spectra, spectrum, but what I'm trying to say, he's no, got a little bit of a You get to use lot. your language. He's your <laughs> son. Your son gets to choose his language. Um, autistic, identity first, is preferred by much of the autistic community, but not all of us. So if on the spectrum is what works for your son and for you, you get to choose your own language. Well, I guess what I'm trying, thank you. What I'm trying to say is that you've got a little bit about all these things. So he's dyslexic, but Uh what I didn't know is there are six parts of the brain that are involved in dyslexia. So if you look at his testing, Mm -hmm. there's five parts. And and I was always like, how could he be dyslexic? He was reading early. He he just doesn't read now, right? And he didn't Mm -hmm. read as a teenager once you got past picture books. And so- but he can read and he's a really strong writer. How could he have dyslexia? But then when you look and see that, okay, these five parts of the brain are, you know, he's blowing through them. He's so, he scores so well, but this one part of the brain, it's so bad. And so I guess my point is you have a little bit of a lot of different things and all of a sudden you end up with, you know, I I mean, it's, you end up with a big thing is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And, and sometimes those people are the ones that miss diagnosis because yeah. like you're saying, it's like, okay, years. surface level dyslexia. So um, like surface level dyslexia, for example, is common with autistic people. That's what I had. It's more of a oh, phonetics. Yes. Because um, yeah, there's different kinds of dyslexia. Um, so you might have I've like- I've never one, heard that term, surface level dyslexia? Yeah. And it's because it has to do more with the phonetic component. Uh-huh. So for example, I- Oh my goodness. If I showed you some of my writings as a second grader, like it's phonetically perfect, but spelling wise. Yeah. That's him. Yeah. That's him. And that is common with autism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Okay. Talk to us about autism and is this true? Okay. So I'm thinking of my son and and he is ashamed of none of this. Like he is so okay. proud of his yeah. dyslexia. He's so That's proud so of awesome. you know, his ADHD. He's like, you guys are losers. I'm the one, you know, who's got it going on. Um, when I think about him though, he is very, it's interesting. He's very emotional. Like my, my mom just passed away and it was completely mm. sudden. Oh, and so he was very emotional about that. But everything else, like he's, he's not a hugger, you know, he kind of will hug you like this and is that autism, you know, where he just seems like physical contact is just not his thing? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. Body boundaries are really important to and me. And same thing um, with words too. He's not the kind mm-hmm. of, he'll say, I love you, but you mm-hmm. know what I mean? My sister. Affection, my, yeah. My yeah. Gushed. And that, absolutely. Like, um, and I think largely for sensory reasons, like it's just, and this, this was one of those things you know, back to you asked what was health, what's, how has my life changed since diagnosis? My partner and I have just have so much more language. Like when he used to touch me, like impromptu, I, I would, um, kind of clench up and I'd like have a visceral response. And obviously that's really hard on a marriage of like, I touch you and you have a reaction. We now have language for this kind of thing. And which has been so helpful for us. So yeah, touch, especially unexpected touch, light touch tends to be really hard for a lot of autistic people. Oh my goodness. Where was I going? And what was your question? <laughs> oh, and emotions. So yeah. a lot of us, and this is one, of, there's so many similar to ADHD. Like there's just so many unfortunate stereotypes about autism. The one of the most unfortunate being that we don't, that we lack empathy or, or emotionality. We may experience it differently. We may express it differently, but a lot of us, not all of us, but a lot of us actually have hyper empathy. And so we can, pick, especially like pain and suffering in the world. A lot of us are very attuned to it. 
and very impacted by it. And we might not always have words for it. Like, so for me, if someone asks how I'm feeling, I can't really tell you how I'm feeling, but I could write you an essay about how I'm doing. And I could write you an essay about my inner world. And I'd probably use a lot of metaphor, but I wouldn't use emotion words to describe it. So interesting. I mean, as you're speaking, I'm thinking, I'm not a physical touch person either. Like I'm not, you know, friends are just constantly wanting to hug. I'm just like, yeah, you know, I'm also very unemotional when people are emotional and very practical and Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. pretty masculine. I mean, I know people don't expect that, but I feel very masculine in my- I love that. You're like in pink and and pink nails and you're masculine. I love that actually. Which is a struggle, right? In society because women aren't supposed to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. So the more I'm talking about you and just watching you and hearing you speak, I don't know, but you're telling me, but I can't have a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, so, and that's where I think there is like we have to get better language for this because we we do know ADHDers have more autistic traits. Mm-hmm. So how do we talk about that without falling into the like little bit aut- autistic, little bit ADHD? So I think language like I'm ADHD and I've got a handful of autistic traits. Um, I think that kind of language is um, you're able to describe your experience and still stay af- kind of affirming in your language use. Yeah, I, I think we need better language around that. The other thing, have you heard of alexithymia? Mm-mm. Oh, yeah. Wait, say it again. I might be mis saying it, which is kind of embarrassing because I have I say it all over the place. Alexithymia is how I, A-L-E-X-I-T-H-Y-M-I-A, alexithymia. No, uh, it's, I, thought, it, I thought you were talking about... Um, it's no longer in the DSM, but what is the depression where it's just kind of this mid-grade um, dystemia? Oh, anadina, right? ana, uh, like no loss oh, of pleasure, anadina. anadina. Um, again, yeah. it's probably another word I'm mispronouncing. Yeah, so and me too. <laughs> okay, so explain to me what alexithymia, alexithymia is. is. Again, I might not be pronouncing it right, um, but that's how I say it. So it's a personality trait. It's not something that's diagnosed, but it is difficulty identifying and describing emotions. It's connected to interoception, which is one of our sensory systems. So like our body awareness. So when we struggle with interoception, we often have alexithymia. So then it's no surprise about 50 to 60% of autistic people have alexithymia, difficulty identifying, describing emotions, and about 40 to 50% of ADHDers have alexithymia, difficulty identifying and describing emotions. Now what's happened, especially in autism, but I would think also in ADHD, we have conflated severe alexithymia and autistic traits. So for example, there's a whole series of studies that have looked at like um, emotion recognition in voice and faces, as well as empathy doing brain scans. And they found that once they controlled for alexithymia, so, so they studied autistic people, some who had alexithymia, some who didn't. Once they controlled for alexithymia, autistic people no longer had any differences than non-autistic people with emotion recognition of people's faces, of tone of voice, um, the empathy, that it was actually alexithymia that um, was was making that that difference. Yeah. With ADHD, when someone has ADHD and alexithymia, they struggle a lot more with emotional regulation is what I've seen because they're not registering when they're getting stressed. So they don't register till it's out of 10. And so a lot of the emotional regulation piece for ADHD, we've got to address and identify the underlying alexithymia. That is fascinating and it makes perfect sense. So you can teach people though, right? Mm-hmm. How yeah, alexithymia can right. get better with practice. Like, So I have alexithymia, but because I've been trained as a psychologist, um, I would say I've, I have like mild, I have a lot of tools now that help mm-hmm. me identify what I'm feeling. I know how to do the work to do that. So it is one of those things that can be improved. And I think if, if a neurodivergent person struggling with emotional regulation, they've got to spend some time um, looking at and working with alexithymia and interoception. Well, and it makes perfect sense. If you have autism and ADHD and you know you feel something, it doesn't feel good and you just react, right? Rather than pausing and, okay, what is it that I'm feeling? What is, because that happens to me a lot where I will literally be upset about something and I have no idea what I'm upset about. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know what is this feeling and why, and so I have to pause and connect it. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. (laughs) And And then once you connect it, it's like, 
Okay. Yes. This makes sense. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm starting to come over to your side. (laughs) Okay. So what other questions do I have for you? So autism and ADHD are very similar, correct? In that women and girls go undiagnosed and Mm -hmm. symptoms look different in women with autism than men with autism, just like in ADHD. Am I correct in that? Um, so uh, I, I just need to nuance everything. I think this is my, Please. this is my neurodivergent brain. So, so yes and no, like, um, there's the autistic female phenotype that came out a couple years ago that really just kind of moved the autism research of realizing like, oh my goodness, there's so many more presentations of this. Um, the one, like we're kind of at the next level of that where what we're mm-hmm. realizing, and I would say the same for ADHD is anyone can have that presentation. And I think that's especially important in this conversation because autistic and ADHD people are way more likely to be gender diverse or gender queer or non-binary. So a lot of the language around female and male autism or female and male ADHD, like we're, when we stick to the gender binary, we're missing a lot of us. So yeah. this is another area where it's, it's really tricky if we've got to talk about how it often presents different differently in girls and women. And we've got to be, in in my opinion, like gender inclusive in how we talk about it and realize there's plenty of like cis men who are also presenting in these non-stereotypical ways. So yes, women and girls tend to present differently. And there's a ton of gender bias in the instruments we have, even the DSM criteria. um, And then I would add that nuance. So are you talking about autism specifically or autism and ADHD? For gender diversity? Yeah, well, exactly. Um, Because I remember reading that women with ADHD are much more likely to be gender diverse, right? Yeah, so there's a study of kids who'd been referred to a gender clinic. um, And they found both, I think it was, I wish I had the stats in front of me, but it was five point something times more likely to be ADHD and six point something times more likely to be autistic. And then ADHDers are also more likely to be like bisexual or LGBT. Mm-hmm. You and autistic people are very much like there's one study that showed 70% of us are non-heterosexual, which wow. is kind of an umbrella for that, that includes asexuality and aromantic, mm-hmm. but it also includes all kind of everything that's not cis and heterosexual. So those are pretty significant numbers. Yeah. And I totally understand it with ADHD because we tend to challenge the status quo. We're not so locked into, you know, society's, uh, you know, whatever, you know, they've set up social structures. That makes sense. But why do you think with autism? I mean, I think the same thing, like social norms, I would say social norms don't have the same impact on us. Like we just like the way I see them, it's just like, those are things that society has decided to agree upon. Why? Like I'm, I'm so much more open to questioning mm. or, or, or just, I think my experience of social norms is just not, I don't have the same, like when I see my spouse, you know, there's so much discomfort with anything that would go against social norms. Right. Whereas for me, it's like, that's a construct, like totally. And, and so I think, there's more openness to yeah, questioning the status quo. Yeah, it's interesting. I think there's probably a, lo- a lot of reasons. And it's definitely an interesting overlap that I think warrants, like, I think we'll know a lot more in the next five or 10 years that explain helps explain some of that overlap. Well, that's exciting. I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think we are so close to some big breakthroughs in our mm-hmm. understanding. Yeah, of it's all an exciting time. Yeah, it's an exciting time to be in this field. So what is it about you and your ADHD that makes you good at what you do? And then I'm going to ask you, and how does your autism make you even oh. better? <laughs> oh, I like that question. So first, like ADHD traits, so like creativity, passion, thinking outside the box, all of these things I think really help me as a business owner. And the visualization. So I often talk about how I I think more in visuals and metaphor than words. And that's really what I've become known for on social media and my website is taking these academic concepts and and turning them into visuals. And that would be your dyslexia in part, right? Oh. Because you think visually rather than- You just gave me an aha moment. Yes. I think it it probably is that too. Yeah. Right brain. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, So those are- ADHD traits that have served me well. 
ADHD experiences that have served me well because I struggled so much in school. Like, you know, the first time I realized other college students were going to lecture and learning what they needed to learn and then maybe skimming the reading and doing okay, I was shocked. I thought you go to lecture to learn what you need to learn and then you go home and do it. <laughs> like I would go home and like I would watch videos, I would make diagrams, I would I would figure out how to learn what they were talking about in lecture. I totally I did that too. Did you? <laughs> but it, it gets in deep, right? When you do that, it gets in deep. So I think by like deconstructing my own education experience has made me a good teacher. And I that's I I can't call myself an Instagram influencer or social media influencer. I prefer to think of myself as like a public teacher. And I think that's what makes me a good teacher is I know from like completely deconstructing my education experience, I I know some things that help information to stick to the brain. So that experience of ADHD struggle with school has, I think, really served me well. Okay. And how does your autism make you even better? Really the special interest energy. Um, the, the, what I see, like I do, I sometimes, I feel bad for ADHDers who don't have autism to support them. So sometimes ah. I see them flutter from passion project to passion project yes. without an anchor. And my, my special interest gives me like an object to orbit around. And so like owning my business is the perfect thing as an autistic ADHDer because I've got my main object to orient around. Then I've got all these side pro- projects of like learning about how to search engine optimize my content or how to like make a landing page. I've got all these fun rabbit trails, but they all orbit around an enduring interest. And so that has really helped rein in my energy and help channel it. And so I I think that's, that's a a significant way that my autism has really helped, helped out my ADHD and helped me. And and that is one thing that when I think about the women that I've interviewed that have both autism and ADHD, and I think of the women that I've worked with that have both autism and ADHD, I think you're absolutely right. They all seem to be so, they know what the thing is that they should be working on, Mm -hmm. right? And they have managed to build everything around that. So if you're talking about traditional success, they seem to have a much easier time of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then again, you know, I think I, I've worked with plenty of people who are ADHD dominant, ADHD autistic, and, and they're, it's causing more havoc. But I think for those of us who are more autistic dominant, it really, mm-hmm. um, it, it can be helpful for, for me. It certainly has not everyone's experience, but for me, it, it definitely has. Right. right. Absolutely. Okay. So what do you think the key to living successfully with ADHD and autism is? Um, let's see figuring out how to work with your brain style. Um, and again, if you have the privilege to do so restructuring your career and your life to be able to work with it. So for example, one thing for me, I do work ahead a lot, which I know is very non ADHD of me, but I do that so that on a given day I can pair my work to my energy. So I often talk about like having bucket A, bucket B, and bucket C work. And this is language my kids know. They're like, are you in bucket B or bucket A work right now? (laughs) And bucket A is like that high, you know, high cognitive tasks. And by working ahead, you know, I can wake up. My energy fluctuates so much, Mm -hmm. which is really common both for ADHD and autistic women. And I think especially autistic ADHD women. I can wake up and I can align my projects with my energy. You know, if I'm trying to write an assessment report and my my executive function just isn't online that day, it's going to take me four times as long. So by being able to flow with my energy versus working against my energy has been really helpful. Um, so building a life that enables that has, has helped me as an autistic ADHD. Thank you. So I have one last question that just kind of flashed in my brain. I'm curious I love if, It has been your experience that those with ADHD and autism, let's say women, because that's certainly who I work with and that's who our audience is here, do they tend to be more inattentive than hyperactive combined type? That's what the research shows. Um, And 
one, again, to nuance it, um, I think we want to look at the internalization. So I I think for one, I, I think it is probably like we truly do have that type more often. Um, but then I think also we want to look at, is there internalized hyperactivity happening? Because again, because of the social conditioning. Oh, and there um, always is, right? I've never not seen hyperactivity. They need to get I, rid of that. It's either the body I have, or the brain. I have met some people who truly have an ADHD inattentive type. There's something, it's a terrible term, but there's a term called sluggish cognitive tempo. Yes, yes. Um, and so, and those folks, when I work with them, they're, they're, I really, there isn't, I'm not hearing the internalized hyperactivity. Really? Um, and, and there's some cases. And there's no external hyperactivity either. And no external hyperactivity. Body, it really, really is ADHD and, and attentive type. Yeah. Okay. So is that ADHD? It is. It's So there's three, when we diagnose, and again, it, these things get changed every five uh-huh. years, but it's when we diagnose it, it's the diagnosis code. It's ADHD. And then there's a slash combined type hyperactive or inattentive type. I'm asking about sluggish cognitive tempo. Is that really ADHD? That's oh, what I, oh. I first thought, you know? I see. Yeah. I, I want to know more about what's going on there. Sometimes I've wondered, because so autistic people tend to have slower processing speed because we're so detail oriented. Um, sometimes I've wondered, is are those ADHD autistic people being missed? Um, has been one of my curiosities but, but yeah, I mean, that's really interesting, right? That someone can have sluggish cognitive tempo and have ADHD and someone can be so hyperactive and have ADHD. I mean, it, both ADHD and autism, there's so many ways that these can be expressed. No two people are going to look at all alike. I know. That's what makes it so difficult, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I was talking to Cynthia H- Hammer, who runs the, what is oh, it? Oh, yeah. I've, I, she and I've emailed several times. Yeah. Yeah. She's lovely. And you know, we were talking about uh, inattentive ADHD and, you know, bottom line, it in her understanding, having done this for, I don't know, 30 or 40 years, she's been doing it forever. She believes that inattentive ADHD is slower processing speed. And so I find it interesting that inattentive ADHD is also much more common with autism. And you just said, you've noticed slower processing speed because of, you know, so much attention to detail. It's all so fascinating. Yeah, it is. I, and I, I want to be, yeah, this is speculation. This isn't psychology talk, but I have certainly wondered with ADHD and attentive type, if there's a higher rate of co-occurring autism with that um, has been a curiosity of mine. I haven't seen that validated in the research. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is the research the same as with ADHD? There's just not a lot of research on um, autism in women and certainly not autism it's ADHD changing. in women. Um, it is. And there's actually a fantastic book that just came out by um, Donna Henderson and a few others. Um, is this autism? And it is like, it, and it's so peer reviewed. It's, you know, Rutledge published it. And I, the reason I'm so excited about this is because a medical provider would have a really hard time reading this and dismissing it. Um, and they, they're talking broadly about non-stereotypical autism, but they're drawing a lot on what we've learned from the girls is how they phrase it. Mm-hmm. And so it's changing but we still have a lot of catch up to do. And more so, I would say the research is there, but it's not being disseminated to clinical training programs. So for example, for me, I discovered my autism and ADHD in spite of my training experience, not because of it. Crazy. Isn't it? It's sad. So the research is out there if you're looking for it. It just hasn't gone mainstream yet. So the book that you just recommended, highly recommended, is called Is This Autism? And Mm -hmm. who is it by? It's by, I have it right here, um, Donna Henderson and Sarah Wayland, and then um, with Jamil White as well. It's Is This Autism? A Guide for Clinicians and Everyone Else. So um, clinicians, this is a great book, but if you're kind of a more cerebral autistic person or curious about autism, this is a fantastic book. I I haven't read a book cover to cover in a couple of years. And I read this in a weekend and I was just, oh. it's such a great combination of research, but also lived experience and stories and then clinical work. And, and so it's very um, scholarly while being accessible. I am going to buy it the minute uh, we get off this podcast. So Megan, are you working on something that you want to tell us about? Yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm working on self-care for autistic people. I don't know if you're, are you aware of the self-care for AD, people with ADHD book that came out a couple years ago? Yes. 
So it's kind of like a, it's like a parallel book to that uh-huh. um, with Simon and Schuster. Uh huh. Oh, and so it's bite sized self care tips for autistic people. It should be released, I think, early 2024. I'm mm-hmm. in the middle of writing my manuscript. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, no, no, maybe you'd love to write. It was the hardest thing. Oh, I've ever no. Done. I mean, it's, I, I, I love it and I have a lot of uh, like procrastination around it. So it's, it's a both and for sure. Um, So that's my big project I'm working on right now. And where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what you do? Yeah. So especially if people are listening to this and if they're having questions like you of like, actually, I, I think, I think I might also be autistic. Um, My Instagram is my main social media platform. So neurodivergent underscore insights. Um, but I also, I have a lot of resources up on my website, which is neurodivergentinsights.com. I have, I create monthly, um, workbooks, which are basically wellness or mental health workbooks curated for the neurodivergent person in mind. And then I've got a lot of free blog posts. So things like alexithymia, interoception, sensory regulation, all these things I've been kind of referencing throughout. I've got a lot of blog posts up on that as well. So I want to say that I really love your Instagram. It's no surprise that you are, what did you call it? Surface, surface level dyslexia, because I love how you take the research and then you translate it into that right brain, right? Graphics. Mm -hmm. And it makes everything so understandable. It's, it's really brilliant. So congratulations on that. And um, let's add the podcast because I don't see it here um, in our resources. So the podcast is Divergent Conversations, correct? Yes, that's correct. Wonderful. Megan, Anna, look at I got both names. Thank you you so much for spending time with us here today. This was so fun. And can I tell you, you were worth the wait. Oh, that's, that's very kind. I'm, I'm really glad that you invited me on and this was such an enjoyable conversation. So thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So that's what I have for you for this week. If you liked this episode with Megan Anna, Dr. Megan Anna, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. And you know what? Your reviews help in that regard. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Thank you for listening and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is a OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.